All right, so now I have to take a little side trip and explain what it means to say center. Each of these phrases is an anaphora. It is repeated at specific places to bookend parts of history so that when you read these words, they aren't just like vague. Prophecy is not supposed to be vague. If it's vague, then it's not really helpful. Okay, see when it says, and then all will see, and he's leaving out the word mourn, the son of the man. And it's only a Daniel 7, uh, Daniel 7, 13 translation. All will see, and the word mourn is omitted, the son of man, the son of the man. Okay. Because it's got the in there. It's monadic. It means unique. The unique man. Coming in the clouds. Now that's used in Hebrews 11 too, also. Which, you know, really begs the question about, about who wrote the book of Hebrews. And I'm now betting that it's Matt, Mark. But that's a side trip I, I can't afford to get into right now. The point is, is that that's a phrase that's used... It's actually been predicted since the Old Testament. And it's like, okay, I know this already. Why are you telling me the heart, you know, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will darken and the moon won't give up its light, and the fall, stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be, oh, like an earthquake. Shaken is not a good translation. Shaken like an earthquake shakes. Okay. And you get, you're left with this sort of vague sense, okay, sometime in the future there's a seven year tribulation. Yes, that's true. And all these terrible things will happen. So why do I need this now? Because I'm not going to be in it. Okay, but you are in it. That's the whole point of the text. Is that what we're going through now is a dress rehearsal, a series of wash, rinse, rinse repeat dress rehearsals for that seven year tribulation because. Israel rejected Christ. He died seven years early. So the historic, the historical trend that was supposed to occur as a result of him being accepted is now prolonged. It w it, had he been accepted, he would have died at age 40. There would have been 50 years of evangelizing the Gentiles, an intensive one. And the Gentiles would reject him. Not all of them, of course, but many. As a result of which the temple was going to go down anyway. And during that last seven years, all this was going to happen. That was when the demons were going to return and all the other stuff that Revelation ends up talking about. But he didn't die on time. He died seven years early. And the scholars missed that because they used lunar years in Daniel 9, right, in Daniel 9.26, rather than solar years. And the Bible only uses solar years. So they don't recognize that he died early. He was on a schedule to die at age 40. Even Sanhedrin in the Talmud, even Sanhedrin 97 through 99 recognizes that. But he died at age 33. And one of the reasons the Jews don't believe Jesus is the Christ is because he didn't die at age 40. And this is explaining why he's not going to die at age 40. He's the one talking. This is his deathbed prophecy for the history of the world. And it's a tradition that goes all the way back to Jacob in Genesis 49. So the Jews should recognize it from the text, but they won't read it. Okay, fine. We know that much. All right, but why is somebody, therefore, in church who isn't going to go through this getting this now? Well, first of all, you could argue, well, it's because it's really for the trib people. But then that tempts you to think, well, it doesn't apply now. Yes, it does apply now, because the rapture can happen at any time. Satan doesn't know when it's going to happen. So he's constantly orchestrating history to f tribulation conditions in case the rapture happens. All right, He's always orchestrating to make tribulation conditions. And what that helps him do is that helps him discredit God, that helps him discredit the Bible, that helps him make believers, make it really hard for any believers who do believe in him to actually study and learn scripture. And he's had phenomenal success. At this point, we're at 900 years of success. So here's the current dress rehearsal 
in the form of our boy Constantine the seventh and his son Romanus the second is born right here 938 939 940 the historians disagree about which year but it's by 940 at the latest okay and that makes his grandpa, Ra Romanus I, who is still acting as regent and emperor, that makes him decide he wants to change his mind about not letting Constantine VII rule. So yeah, that's shaking up the powers in the heavens because per the Byzantines, their own idea was that the empire, the emperor, was indissoluble, in, in, uh, indivisible from Christianity itself. It's a total satanic doctrine that, of course, they don't read Revelation 17 to find out it was satanic. satanic. But it's a satanic doctrine that you, you know, unify church and state. Always been. Moses was never a priest. The Bible makes a big stink about that. Separation of the secular rule, okay, from religious rule. Because religious rule is voluntary. You believe in God or you don't. You believe in a certain version of your ver vision of God or you don't. That's freedom. Okay, but they didn't believe in that in the Byzantine Empire. They wanted everybody to have to conform to their apostate brand of Christianity. So this is shaking up the emperor. So it's shaking up Christianity. So it's shaking up the heavens. You get that. Okay. That's what's so cute about this. Now, the question is, what does this period from here, 940 A.D., back to here, when Leo III started, 723 B.C., why is it a center? And how do I know that that is the center? Well, what you do we have to go back to 20, which is where we're, I'm saying the center starts. Now look in the middle of the screen where the introduct links are, right here. I don't dare click too much because it'll click on them and then this whole screen will move. Okay. You have a series of anaphora in Mark. You have the Blepo anaphora. You have the Jesus Christos anaphora, which is right here. I didn't separately make a section on it because it has the same verses as Blepo. And then you have a Kurios anaphora, and then a subset of the Kurios anaphora is Huios. Okay, so Jesus and Kurios and Huios are all the same person. Blepo and Ide are two versions of the same verb. Blepo has a sen the sense of paying attention to something. Ide from Horaho has the connotation of just seeing something or observing something, whether you're paying attention to it or not. Okay, so when we say pay attention or look, we mean pay attention. Look at something and focus on it. Horaho just means, oh, I'm watching TV. You're paying attention, but not very much. Okay, but it's still a form of seeing. So these are two synonyms that are repeated at specific times to show specific events in history that are important in the narrative, because that's what this really ends up being, a prophetical narrative of history, a prophetical sat satirical nat narrative. And then our second, as it were, set of anaphora has to do with the sort of like nicknames of Christ. He's Jesus, he's Christos, Jesus means Savior, Christos means Anointed. He's Kurios, he's the Lord, he's Huios, he's the Son. Son of man, Daniel 7.13. So, so what you do, and I learned this when I did it with Paul, because Paul does the same thing, and I wondered where he got it from, is you first map out where, at what syllable counts are each of the occurrences of these words. And that's what each of these notes shows you. Okay? So for Jesus... It's verse 2, verse 5, and going in order, verse 20, verse 21, then verse 26, there's verse 32, 34, 35. 
Now since seeing is important, but not as important as Christ, then your center is going to have to be the most important of the anaphora you find. So obviously it's Christ. The first time his name appears is in verse 2. Second time is in verse 5. Then he's referenced instead as Kurios in verse 20. Referenced as Christos in verse 21. Referenced as Huios in verse 26. And again in verse 32 and 34. Except it's using the word Anthropu there. Son of man. So just use man as shorthand. And then finally, he's referenced as Kurios again in verse 35. So what you do is you take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. The references of the anaphora to Jesus are 8 in number. And those are where they're the references are located. Okay, well if it's 8... Then you're looking for the center, because this is how Paul did it with Ephesians 1, to focus on Constantine. The center of 8 means that you have to pick 2. Okay, so going in order, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, if it's five, six, seven, eight, and then you have to pick this one and this one, or you could say this one really, in verse 21, yeah, as Christos, right here, see, upper, upper window, upper left, Christos. So it's really 21 and 26, because before 21, you got one, two, three. After 26, you got one, two, and three. So that's the center. The center is really 21 and 26. However, Kurios houses Huios. So if Huios is the center, Christos, Kurios comes before this. So it's kind of like an envelope. Because it starts at 20, which includes 21 and 26, and it ends at 35, which includes 32 and 34. And you say, well, but it doesn't include verses 2 and 5. Well, yeah, that's important for a different reason, which we're going to see in a minute. So the center of all the references to Christ is verse 21 and verse 26. So it's like a little paragraph running for verse 21 here, to 26 here and what you're supposed to interpret from that is that the key turning point in history that makes it turn out the way it does is happening from verse 21 to verse 26 it's not quite verse 20 but verse 20 is that is like the envelope for it the house okay well verse 21 is still part of that same house all right, because Leo the Third had married this gal Irene, who causes so much trouble, off to his son, and that's why the problems are going to happen. And this thing that she does by being Miss Dominating Mother, trying to take control of it herself, that's a recurring theme in Byzantine history. It's a recurring theme in history too, but it's a particularly prominent theme in Byzantine history for the women to take over and try to do something they don't want to be behind in the gymnasium anymore it's like a separate room where all the royal women were kept it's not really just a room it's a separate palace oriental um, oriental monarchy is very uh, distant and it's patterned after Diocletian. It's very distant. It's very high. You didn't you didn't see your monarch parading in the streets or on TV. There was this mis mysticism, this myth that was you know created about the monarch, and you never actually saw the monarch. So you were just believing in hearsay the whole time. And the women in particular were walled off 
And so they didn't like it at times. And this woman, Irene, she didn't like it. And so when her, when, when Leo the Third died, and her son was still too young, she just said, you know what, I'm regent. And she didn't marry anybody. Okay? Well, not at first, anyway. Um, so that was a big deal. So that's a trend of history that's central to Byzantine history. And it's being marked here by verse 21, and then verse 26 is the same kind of story with Constantine the Seventh. Only this time the region is a male, Romanus the First. And that regency was actually appointed um, for him, for Constantine the Seventh, before um, his dad died. Or when his dad died. Or as a result of his dad's order at the time his dad died. So you don't have the woman front and center really. Well, I mean, she's active, but you don't have her really front and center here. Okay? So the center point of history is depicted by the center anaphora. And the center, most important anaphora, is Christ. And so the center is here to here, as shown on screen. Here's verse 26, which is the end of it, excuse me, and verse 21, which is the start. Now, that's not all the story because you say, well, okay, fine, what about Blepo? What about the Blepo anaphora? Well, it just so happens that when you count the Blepo the same way we just did Christ, you get verse 21 also as the center of Blepo, which is what you're looking for. You're looking for convergence of the anaphoras. So here's Blepo. We have one, two, third occurrence, fourth occurrence, fifth occurrence, sixth occurrence, sixth occurrence seventh occurrence, eighth occurrence, ninth occurrence, tenth occurrence, but this has two in it, paired. It's a total of eleven. <coughs> now, depending on how you want to decide and say, okay, if there are eleven, there have to be five on either side, which side do you pick? The most accurate would be to pick this one, okay? But there are two of them. So if you counted it as 10, then you need a pair, and here's your pair right in verse 21. If you counted them as 11, then you'd be counting this one. I mean, that would be 1 to the left, 2 to the left, 3 to the left, 4 to the left, 5 to the left, 6 to the left. So that's why that's kind of not a good idea. <coughs> <coughs> so again, you almost have to pick two of them. Because if you pick this one, and then you got one, two, three, four, five to the left. Okay, but you've only got one, two, three, four to the right. This makes the fifth one. So, you know, you decide whether you want to pick this one as the real center. Oh, crud. I hate that. I shouldn't have clicked on it. Whether you want to pick on the first here is the real center or this one is the real center I, I I could go either way personally I think we should pick on this one because of the whole cadence of it because there's seven apart these two alright so that's the center of blepo so see the center of the blepo anaphora is the same as the center of the Christ anaphora so that's your true starting point no matter how you count it and it goes at least to verse 26 as your end. So between 21 and 26, that's the center of history for the Byzantine Empire. Now, the reason why I'm saying we should go back to 20 also is because, yeah, this is the center. Because I said, you know, Christ, Christ Anaphora. But Quias is totally contained within the Quias text. The Quias text is 20 and 35. We got 26, 32, and 34. All of it inside, in the middle. So, we ought to take, pay attention to verse 20. And if we do, then we'll include 20 and 21. See, so here's 20, 21 through 26. Then we'll be sure to include all the keywords. Otherwise, you're leaving out Quias. You say, well, but you're leaving out, you're leaving out 
Well, you're not. You're not leaving out huios because it starts there. So the first. So if we go back to verse 20, we see that the center of history, including all the keywords, all of them, is between 20 and 26. Now maybe you want to say, well, no, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go vote for 21 through 26. Okay, but you see why I picked 20 because I think it's an important thing that Huias is totally ensconced inside Kurios. I think you're supposed to go back one. And you end up going back one anyway because the lady who's causing this trouble was married to and has now a, a son of the guy who started the ball rolling here, Leo the Third. Okay? Well, she's actually married to the son of and then he dies and he's got there's another son so that's how she gets into powers because her son is below age and her husband was the son of Leo the third here so in order to get the the context for her you kinda have to go back in time and since the Bible sevens right here beginning here it seems to me argu arguably correct that we shouldn't just start at verse 21 we should start at verse 20 that way that way we're including all the keywords alright and in this case it ends up if it ends at 26 it ends up with Kurios starting it and Huyas ending it and they're both seven di all these things are seven distances from each other and when you go check in Byzantine history you can very well argue that well everything that happens in Byzantium after 940 AD is thoroughly a, a product of it and the same trends that occur between 723 and 940 just recur with progressively greater weakness in other words if the time to solve the problem of the woman taking power was right here okay and it's not against women to say that. It, it's a phenomenon of society that when women are ruling in society, it's a bad time for society. Okay, it's not ha doesn't really have anything to do with women. It has to do with how society regards women. Society typically does not regard women well. All right, so then if the society doesn't regard women well, they tend to rebel. They tend to go off on their own. They tend to play games and you know all the other stuff so it's really not a good idea for women to have political power at that level at that kind you know monarch I'm not so sure it's bad for a woman to be a senator or something I would never want it but definitely not you know like the head of the empire alright although England seems to be having a pretty good time of it and Christ is praising the one the one person who did and that one person happened to be a woman so you know, take my words, my own personal attitude is grain of salt, or pound of salt. Alright, so 21 and 26 look like it's pretty defensible as the center. I would argue 20 to 26 for the reasons therefore given. And then go study that period to see, oh wow, no wonder Christ centers it here. Because this bothers me a great, great deal. I don't like seeing it 7 here, and here, and here, and here. I don't understand why it's doing that, but it's very clearly intended because I tried like hell to come up with other ways to meter this, and I can't. If you can, let me know. All right. You say, well, what about this Kai here, or what about this Idu here? It's grammatically incorrect. I mean, this is in the Matthew text, okay? But he's pairing twenty fives. And he pair he pairs his clauses. All right, like let me show you. Well, there's a twenty-six, and there's a twenty-four. See, paired twenty-threes, but I saw a pair in twenty-five before. And that looks like it's out of place. <coughs> Maybe it's 
you who's out of place. Yeah, okay. Hmm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe that should be... I don't know why this changed width. I don't know what makes it change like that. Um... Bible work says this doesn't belong in the text. The UBS text doesn't contain it. Um, the MT and the TR are critical editions, so you can't go by them. You have to use the actual manuscripts. So, in a way, that's kind of like the only time there is a 25 in there. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I didn't look at the top. There's, 20, there's a lot of 24s. Play on 24 hours. Here's a 27. That's unique. 26 and 24. Two 23s. Two 16s. See, he likes to pair text when he can. A lot of 24s. Moses liked using 17. 9 and 7, 16, 9 and 7, so did Isaiah. Okay, well that's the only 25 in there, so you might be able to make some kind of argument with that, but you're going to have to argue with the scholars who say that Kai doesn't belong. And I don't have a good argument to say it, it, it does belong. It is in Matthew, and what the scholars thought was that somebody was inserting the Kai there because it is in Matthew, but it's not actually in the manuscripts that were behind it, so that they think that it was a scholar insertion rather than actual word mark wrote. And I, I, that works. And the reason why that works is because all the rest of this works. And you'll notice there's a pattern here. Seven, 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 seven. It's like it's saying, hi, you're coming to the, the nexus. This is a nexus. All right. And it starts here. And then I'm going to really set center on this because behold I told you in advance maybe that ought to be seven I mean it's, it certainly stresses it I and mean, that's probably the idea and then he's like bracketing he's saying okay well, there's some kind of big change that happens after this which we've already gone through what the change was so that's how come I'm coming up with the center now you might want to say something else but at least now you know the mechanics you count the, you first of all determine all the occurrences, including synonyms. And then you count them, and then it's like if there are 11, like here, there are 11, because there's two of them in here, then you end up having one that's the center, which out of 11 will be the sixth one. Because if it's the sixth one, then the five after that totals 11. And it's five on one side, five on the other side. Bible is real big on equidistance. And they didn't use verses like we do. But we're talking about the occurrence of the word. It's not, it's not how many syllable counts after and how many syllable counts before. It's how many occurrences after. How many occurrences before. And do this yourself. And if you come up with a different answer, let me know. So the nexus of history for Byzantines is, as I'm learning it now, barring some correction, from um, 723 with Leo III starting right here until 940 with the change of heart in Romanus I over his new kid, Romanus II, who's the kid of Constantine VII, who's responsible for these women, Zoe and Theodora, both managing to help you know, s keep the empire running with all their friendships and marriages and loverness of military rulers, military important military guys in the Byzantine Empire, all the way through 1057. After which it falls apart, and that's when you have the Battle of Manscart with Alp Arslan defeating uh, Romanus IV, and both of them die the following year. Um, people in Hebrew. Okay. Very clever. Your job's done. You're dead now. And that's the way it ends up going. 
Now, if you got a different interpretation, let me know. Because I'm just trying to show you the methodology. I'm not really claiming that it's 100% right. Some of it's right. But if you don't know the methodology, then you can't, then it's like pointless to even talk about this stuff. Because the methodology will help you find it yourself, not only in this passage, but any Bible passage. Peace out.